it's so good to come back here after 10 years. Um, I was here 10 years ago, and I was reminded of that. Uh, by the way, uh, could you turn that video off? Seeing myself is very distracting. <laughs> could you? I don't want to see myself. That's too big. That's too big. <laughs> Thank you. I feel better now. <laughs> no. Okay. That's okay. That's better. The sky, the beautiful sky. <laughs> All right. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to present now is only a continuation of what was presented already last night. So, if if you weren't here last night, I'm so sorry, but you can get the video. Perhaps. You can order them after Sabbath. But we can do a quick review so you can catch up with the, the faithful ones that came last night, okay? All right, so turn your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel. Go there. Daniel chapter 12. By the way, is your church one of those churches that you're eager for the speaker to stop at 12 p.m.? No. <laughs> You're not like those kind of churches? No. The traditional American churches stop at 12 p.m.? No? Okay, then let's go until 3 p.m., okay? <laughs> All right. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to go until uh, 3 p.m. Don't worry. Your, your food will be still warm when you get down there. Daniel 12, verse 1, the Bible says this. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. <coughs> and last night, we didn't study that much. We only study only a few words. We study about Michael and Standing up, right? All right, so you tell me, who is Michael? Archangel. All right, Archangel, Jesus, all right. And we understood from last night's presentation that the phrase stand up has two major meanings. Meaning number one, stand up means studying the kingdom of God. Also, stand up, meaning Jesus is not sitting down anymore. Therefore, what does that mean? <coughs> Probation is closed. <coughs> By the way, if you have any questions about if this is true, believe it or not, I have a very good backup. Yeah, I'm backed up by a small, tiny lady. Her height is very much like the Asians, but she is not Asian. Her name is Ellen G. White. And when she talked about Michael standing up, probation closed. So there's a confirmation right there. But you can prove it from the Bible. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we have Michael, Jesus, stand up, meaning probation is closed. But what is interesting, the Bible says, at that time. There is a time when probation is going to close. And I want to repeat what I said last night. You are not going to hear from me, not today and ever. I do not know exact time when the probation is going to close. And I believe I have a very good inspirational support to confirm 
that God has not revealed to us the exact time when the probation is going to close and God will not reveal to us exact time when probation is going to close. And I have a whole study on this just from the Bible, but you can always uh, go and check out this topic in the writings of Ellen White when you have time. So, then what does it mean when the Bible says, at that time? Well, don't forget, chapter 11 and chapter 12, they are actually together as one. In fact, chapter 10, 11, and 12, they are all together as one big vision. In fact, this particular vision, compared to other visions that Daniel received, is a lot more in detail. That tells me, perhaps, this is more important. God wants us to know more about this. So then, when the Bible says, at the time, what time is this? Well, I know for sure the Bible is not going to tell me the specific time. However, when we study the verses before, we can see that there is going to be an event in the future. And when this event takes place in the future, you can know for sure the probation is going to close very soon. Are you with me? Yes. I am not saying probation is going to close when that particular event takes place. But when that event takes place, probation is about to close much sooner than before. Are you with me? It is a sign that God is giving it to us to let us know what time we're living in in these last days. And I believe it is important for us to understand what time we're living in these last days so that we can cooperate with the work of Jesus that He is doing in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. What do you say? Amen. So then, what event are we talking about? Well, let's go back. Verse 45 and chapter 11. Are you there? You should be. It's right there. Daniel 11, verse 45, the Bible says this. And, next word please. He shall, next word please, grant. So it's about he doing what? Grant the what? Tabernacle of his palace. He is planting his tabernacle of his palace. Uh, by the way, because the Bible says he is planting the tabernacle of his palace. Now, verse 45, listen, it does not tell you who he is, right? It just tells us what he's doing, right? But it doesn't say exactly who he is. Identity of who he is is not there. However, there is one thing that we can know about this he. The Bible says he is planting the tabernacle of his palace. So, if we can make a good guess, since this guy, he, has powers. You with me? Yes or no? Because he has a palace, it is very likely that he is what? King. Are we together? 
mechanism. So maybe, maybe, we cannot say for sure, based upon verse 45, that he is a king. But that's something that we can just put it right there, somewhere in your mind, and say, okay, this he might be a king. Okay. But we continue. But what is he doing there? The Bible says he is planting the tabernacle of his palace where? Between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and none shall help him. And most likely he will come to his end because Michael is going to stand up and destroy him. So then we have the last event before Michael stands up. What event is that? He, planting the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Who is he? Again, verse 45 doesn't say, right? Okay, then what do we need to do? Should we panic, scream, run out the door? What should we do? All you have to do, just to read the text before, and breathe in, and breathe out. Okay? Verse 45. The Bible says, the tide, but the tidings out of the east and out of the north shall what? Trouble him, therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. So verse 45, four, excuse me, verse 44 says, he is going to destroy many. Are you with me? But verse 44, does it say who he is? No, it does not say who he is. So verse 44 says, he is going to destroy many. Verse 45 says, he is going to plant the tabernacle of his palace. But it doesn't say, those verses, they don't say who he is. Okay, then we have to go to verse before, step by step. Careful investigation. Verse 43, the Bible says it. And he shall have what? Power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over the precious things of Egypt and Lydians. And the Ethiopian shall be at his death. In verse 45, in verse 43, in verse 43, does it say who he is? No. But one thing is for sure. He is not Egypt, right? Yes? Because he's taking over Egypt. Yeah? He's not Ethiopian or he's not Libyan. Okay. But it's still a mystery. Who is he? Alright. Well, let's gather what we got so far. Verse 43. He shall have power. Verse 44. He shall destroy. 45, he shall plant. Yes? Okay. All that I'm doing is to gather action words, name action words from each Bible verse to line them up. Then you can perhaps figure out the drama of this, of these verses. He's going to have a power, he's going to destroy, and he's going to plant. But who is he? What do we have so far? He, he, he. That's all we have. So then we have to go to verse before. Verse 42. By the way, are you able to follow the way I'm thinking? Yeah. It's kind of slow, isn't it? Is it too uh, tedious? Are you getting bored? No. No. Okay, I'm very happy about that. Okay, verse 42. It says, he shall stretch forth his what? Hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Verse 42, do we have a clear identity of this 
He. No, but we know what he's doing. What he's doing is what? Stretching. So verse 42 says, he is stretching his hand. Verse 43 says, he shall have power. 44, he shall destroy. 45, he shall land. Who is he? All right, verse 41 then. This is what you got to do when you study the Bible. Just go verse after verse. All right. 41, the Bible said, he shall, next word please. Enter also into the what? Glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. In verse 41, do we have clear identity of who he is? No, but one thing is for sure, he is not. Edom, Moab, and Ammon, are you with me? But we do understand what he is doing. He is what? Entering into country. So here we, have, here we go. This is what we got so far. 41, he shall enter. 42, he shall stretch his hands. 43, he shall have power. 44, he shall destroy. Oh, now you're getting confidence to respond to me. Very good. No more shy Asians there. 45, he shall what? Plan. So what do we have so far? He enters stretches his hand, have power, destroy many, and plant the tabernacle of his palace. You like that little movement there? It's called biblical drum. It's much better than Korean drums. Amen. <laughs> oh, you laugh at my eyes. I see, I see. Okay, so. But who is he? Then all we have to do, and you're thinking, are we going to go all the way back to Genesis 1 1? <laughs> we might, we might. Yeah, forget, forget, yeah, forget tomorrow. But maybe just the text before is going to break the news. So, you ready for this? Okay, let's find it. Verse 40, the Bible says, at the time of the end shall the king of the what? South push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind and with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overthrow and pass over. So, you, so verse 40, we have a two entities, two characters, two, two kingdoms. It says king of the south and king of the north. So the rest of the verses is about one of those kings, yes or no? Yes? Which one? Is it the king of the north or is it the king of the south? Are you guessing? Yes. Are you like flipping quarter? Yes. How do you know? No, no. Give up now. Too hard. Bible's difficult. Boring. Let's go watch American Idols. Yeah? It's very simple. Listen. It's got to be the king of the door. And you look at me like, how do you know that? Well, let me tell you something. There's one thing is for sure. What is that? Whoever this is, he is taking over Egypt. Yes or no? Yes. It says Egypt is not going to escape. And he's going to have power over Egypt. Yes or no? Yeah? And, well, I'm getting strong yes from this corner here. Um, 
But believe it or not, you can check this out from the Bible. It's pretty obvious. Ladies and gentlemen, just to make the long story short, did you know that Egypt is considered the king of the south? Yeah. You can check it out. And by the way, there's not much argument here. Many of the scholars, we all have, I should say, I'm not a scholar, I'm just a Bible student. They all have a basically the same conclusion. Okay? So one thing is for sure, it cannot be the king of the south. Why? Because Egypt is being taken over. So it's got to be the king of the north. And grammatically speaking, contextually speaking, it is the king of the north. So then we got it. We know. All right. It is the king of the north. And what is he going to do? He is going to enter. enter. And he's going to stretch his hands. He's going to have power. And he's going to destroy many. And he's going to plan the tabernacle of his palace. Yeah, we got it now. But who is king of the north? Without knowing who is the king of the north, we have no idea what's going on here, right? Who is this king of the north? Oh, by the way, oh, one confirmation. One confirmation. You remember the Bible says, he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace. And we were guessing that he's got to be king. And guess what? King of the north is palace. It makes perfect sense. So it's got to be, according to the Bible prophecy, especially in the book of Daniel, when the Bible says king of the north, it's got to be, for sure, it's a political power. You with me? A political power. So then, King of the North, according to Daniel 11, because Daniel 11 began with Persia, and then Greece, and then, according to the Bible language, it was a constant battle between king of the south, king of the north, back and forth. But king of the north always taking the reign, the power, and the dominion. And at the end, he is still the main power at the end. So, so ladies and gentlemen, I can say very simply, the final power that is described in Daniel 11. The final power just before the kingdom of Michael. Just before the kingdom of God. It's got to be this king of the north. Yes? Then who is this king of the north? You see? What I'm about to say right now, this is going to sound pretty complicated, but it is totally up to you. You can keep it complicated or you can keep it simple. It's really according to the way you want to think. But God made it pretty simple. You see, in the book of Daniel, God already gave same historical lines, line of the kingdoms in prophetic language three times before Daniel 11. Just to give you a review, you remember studying, you remember having, going through a Daniel seminar when you were coming into a Seventh Adventist church? Was that the only time you had your Daniel study? If that is so, let me remind you what you learned in the past. Okay, here we go. Daniel chapter 2. There we have the great image. Daniel chapter 7. There we have the four beasts. Yes? And Daniel chapter 8. There we have, you remember? You remember it getting a little fuzzy? Remember? Ram, 
goat, and the little horn. Remember that? Okay. These three uh, prophetic chapters, 2, 7, and 8. The great image, head of gold, arms of silver, thigh of brass, legs of iron, iron and clay, the feet, remember? The kingdom, do you remember that? Okay. And then the, the beast, lion, bear, leopard, and dreadful beast, and then we have that little horn, yes? And then again, Daniel 8, ran, go, and little horn that goes through two phases. Okay, that's all we look like. I've never heard this before. <laughs> Don't scare me like that, okay? Just give me this look. I know. <laughs> By faith. Okay? Now, again, we don't have, we don't have too many uh, time here to go through all of them, but just to make the long story short, three major chapters are going through basically the same historical line of the major kingdoms, and they are Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, but two phases, two stages. Stage one, pagan Rome. Stage two, papal Rome. Okay, papal Rome. So then, um, when you look at the image, I know what you're thinking. The final kingdom is kingdom of iron and clay. But you see, let me just take some time to explain something to you. When you study Daniel chapter 2, how many kingdoms do you have in the image? People usually tell me these answers. Uh, five or 13 or 16 because they're counting the toes. <laughs> now when you do that, I understand what you're doing because you are comparing between the toes with the ten horns. I understand, I understand. However, if you limit yourself, if you limit yourself just within the chapter 2, chapter 2 does not say, one toe is a kingdom. <laughs> Do you understand? There's no Bible text like that. Pinky toe, pinky kingdom. It doesn't say anything like that. Okay? So when you start calculating, it says, then, uh, then it says, it says, um, another kingdom shall rise after Babylon. And then it says, third kingdom, third kingdom. Yeah, referring to uh, Thy of Breath. And then it says, and the fourth kingdom. And you're expecting the legs of iron. You're correct. Then you're expecting, and the fifth kingdom, guess what? There's no expression of, then the fifth kingdom of iron clay. No. The Bible is trying to tell us, fourth kingdom is really legs and the feet. Fourth kingdom is legs and the feet. Now, historically speaking, I know kingdoms did change and there were many divided kingdoms. I understand that. But the way the Bible is looking at it, the whole thing, as one kingdom. But two stages. Stage one, pure iron. Stage two, iron and clay. So really, in the image, without counting the stone coming down, just the image, we have four kingdoms 
And very interesting, how many beasts do we have in Daniel 7? How many? Four, not five. Interesting, huh? So you have four kingdoms, and you got four kingdoms in chapter 2 and chapter 7. And chapter 7, look at this, consider the fourth beast. Fourth beast has two stages. What is that? Beast with ten horns, and then what? Second stage. Three horns are plucked up, and then little horn. There you go, see? Fourth kingdom in Daniel chapter 7 goes through two stages. Beast with horns, ten horns, and the beast with little horn. It makes perfect sense. And then you will see something very similar when you study Daniel chapter 8. So that tells me very clearly that when you look at Daniel chapter 2, Rome is going through two phases. What is that? Pagan Rome. And for the feet, you can say, and you're not wrong, you're not wrong, but for the feet, the popular, usual answer that we usually give, divided kingdom of Europe, yes? But let me say to you, that is not wrong, but not a complete answer. The complete answer should be papal Rome. Controlling divided kingdoms. Because I and a clay, clay in the Bible represents religious power. I represents political power. So I and clay is mixture between, or they're trying to mix between state and church. So really, in the image, the last reigning power is the second stage of Roman power, which is papal Rome. That's the final power. Daniel chapter 7, lion, bear, leopard, dreadful beast, and the little horn on the beast, that little horn power, papal Rome. Daniel 8, again, if you go there, ram, Persia, goat, Greece, and the goat has little horn, that little horn goes through two phases, pagan and papal Rome. So, what am I trying to tell you? Very simple. Daniel 2, the final power is papal Rome. Daniel 7, the final power is papal Rome. Daniel 8, the final power is papal Rome. So God repeated already three times. Three times. The final power is paper roll. Final power, paper roll. The final power, paper roll. And Daniel 11. Daniel 11 does not use uh, so much of the symbolic language of gold, silver, lion, bear, leopard. No, it just says very clearly Persia. You don't even really have to like interpret. It just says it right there. Persia. It's like if you're not getting it, you should get this. Persia. <laughs> it God says, bear. What is bear? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you straight. Persia. And then after Persia, Greece. But then, with the wisdom and the heavenly, infinite knowledge of God, God made it not so symbolic, but he put it in code. Instead of uh, saying the kingdom's name, he just said, king of the south, king of the north. And king of the north, my friends, basically, Rome. So then, you already have the parallel. So then, what kingdom is the last kingdom in Daniel 11? Who is that king of the north? You already have established pattern. You already have God's repetition. God is keep saying, paper roll, paper roll, paper roll. So you should expect the last power in Daniel 11 should be, the king of the north should be, paper roll, not turkey. 
If you didn't understand what I just said, that's okay. We don't have time to go there. It's people, it's people wrong. It's people. So then, so then. So the king of the north, papal Rome, is going to do this. Look at this. Papal Rome. Enter. Yes. Stretch his hand. In the Bible, hands represent, in the book, uh, in book of Daniel, hands represent power. How do I know? Because, remember three Hebrew boys? They refused to bow down before the golden image. And the king got angry, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, Who is going to deliver you out of my hands? Remember? So in the book of Daniel, hands belongs to a king, represents his power, authority. Yes? So here we go. He shall enter. Yes? And he shall stretch his hands. He shall have power, destroy many, and plant the tabernacle of his palace. Now, when you read this, do you feel like, look at the action words, enter, stretch, power, destroy, plant. Do you feel like you're reading about uh, somebody is building up his strength? He enters, that means he was not he was not there before, yes. He's gaining his his um, what's the English word? His foothold, so to speak. Momentum. Alright, very good. He's he's entering in, stretching his hand, destroying shall have power, destroying many. And the final act of this king of the north, or the the papal Rome. He shall plant the tabernacle of his palace. That means his political power. Where? Between the, seas. between the seas and between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. I know, I know some people. Those uh, uh, eager beaver Bible students out there, you're probably uh, studying about these things and. And what does it mean when the Bible says between the seas and the glorious holy mountain? Is it between the sea and the glorious holy mountain or between the seas and the glorious holy mountain? You don't understand what I just said, right? It's okay. It doesn't matter. And you know why? It doesn't matter. It does not matter exactly where. But one thing is for sure. And that is it. When he plants the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, one thing is for sure, he is trying to take over the glorious holy mountain. Yes or no? Are you listening? He is trying to take over the glorious holy mountain. It looks like in verse, uh, I believe, 41, he entered into glorious land. He entered into glorious land, but for some reason, he was not able to enter into glorious, holy mountain. At this point, things can get a little bit hairy. What a funny English word, huh? Get a little, uh... so take a deep breath. Good boy, Pathfinder. All right, <clears throat> question What is glorious holy mountain? I can see in your eyes you're thinking too deep. Okay, let me put it this way. Uh, okay, um, in the Bible, okay, in the Bible, uh, for the Jewish people, okay, for the Jewish people, which mountain is considered holy? Mount Zion. Mount Zion. That's right. See how easy that is? Yeah. 
you have to break it down to children's story level. Okay. Um, so Glory Holy Mountain is really what? Mount Zion. Mount Zion. Now there is another name for Mount Zion. You know what that is? And then there was a silence. Mount Moriah. Did you know that? Do you know what is sitting on, on the top of Mount Moriah or Mount Zion? Temple. It was. <laughs> A long time ago. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms. Chapter 48. Psalm 48. Psalm 48. Are you there? Okay. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our life. God. It's a city of who? God. In the mountain of His, it's a holy mountain, yes or no? Verse 2. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the what? The earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the, the city of the great king. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very simple. What is sitting on glorious holy mountain, Mount Zion, Jerusalem. So when the Bible says, King of the North shall plant the tabernacle of his palace in the glorious holy mountain, he is trying to take over glorious holy mountain, he is trying to take over Jerusalem. Oh, before you make any conclusions, stop. I am not saying, I am not saying, Papal Rome is going to move from Vatican to Jerusalem. I am not saying that. Now, they may do that. They may open up a little gift shop of Vatican in Jerusalem. I don't know. I mean, they already have one. Okay? But I am not saying Vatican or papacy is going to uh, move their headquarters from, uh, from Rome to Jerusalem. I am not saying that. Then what am I saying? I take this as something symbolic and spiritual. And if you, want to, if you want to know all the reasons why, I don't have time. We can talk about that a little bit later, one to one if you want. But I take it primarily because when the Bible says glorious land, literally talking about, it is talking about Israel. But I know it cannot be literal Israel because Israel ceased. They stopped being God's people AD 34. And this prophecy takes place way after AD 34, for sure. So it cannot, talk, it cannot be talking about literal Israel, literal Jerusalem. So it's got to be something symbolic and global. Anyhow, you can, you can, you know, go home and study on your own and find out what I'm telling you is true. Amen. But here we go. So I take it as more symbolic. So what does it mean symbolically? It means this. Look at this. The king of the north, people Rome. He enters, into, he enters into many countries. But he really wants to enter where? Glorious land and take over everything. 
but he was not able to. Meanwhile, he is stretching his hands. Yeah. And then he says, Egypt will not escape. So, he enters, and most likely from the north. That's the reason why he is called the king of the north. So he enters from the north, the glorious land, and the surrounding countries, they all ran off. And please don't ask me who is Eden, Moab, Ammon. There are things that I don't even know yet. I'm still studying. I'm just sharing with you things that I believe it is clear thus far. But you can always study for yourself. So here we have the king of the north. He enters into many countries, including glorious land. Surrounding countries, bam, they escape. And then he entered into the glorious land, but apparently he was not able to take over glorious land holy mountain. Meanwhile, he's stretching his hands to other countries, gaining power, and then he then takes over Egypt. Are you with me? Meaning, he got the major country below Israel. Yes. After he got Egypt, he is coming back for a glorious holy mountain. So he basically got all the countries around. And now his final target is glorious holy mountain, Jerusalem. And he wants to take over Jerusalem. Why? Because only one reason. According to the Bible, the Bible says glorious holy mountain, the city of God, and city of great king. It's a city for God and a city for the great king. Don't you, don't you get it? He wants Jerusalem. Why? Because he wants to be, he wants to exercise his authority as God and a great king. God, religion, king, political. Are you listening? Are you following? And the Bible says, Jerusalem is the joy of the whole earth. Don't you know Jerusalem is considered for many center of the whole world? Again, I'm not saying literally paper Rome is going to move to Jerusalem, but the king of the north, the papal Romans, the final act is going to be something about attempting to take complete control over the whole world, religiously and politically. And this is being expressed by saying he is planting the tabernacle of his palace. In fact, this language is also very interesting. Tabernacle of his palace. Tabernacle, palace. Tabernacle in the Bible, especially in the Bible, in the Old Testament, who usually dwells in tabernacle? What kind of people usually dwell in a tabernacle? Priests. I preach. As palace, what kind of people usually dwell in a palace? King. So you got priest, king. He is planting the tabernacle of his palace. He is trying to establish religious and political power in the center of the world in order to control, dominate the whole world. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? So then the drama and story is clear. Verse 40 to 45, this is, these verses are talking about painful comeback. It got wounded in 1798, but it's coming back. How? Slowly, systematically, gain her power, enters. Stretch his hands, 
shall have power, destroy many, and establish the tablet of his palace. But at that time, he is not going to be able to accomplish his intent. Why? Because Michael is going to stand. So then, how do we put this in a, a layman's term? Very simple language. In the future, when you think church and state unite to enforce a law to control the whole world, and all, all that action is really giving allegiance to Babel Rome, you better know that the probation is going to close very soon. Are you listening? Well, I got a surprise for you. All that I talked about last night and just now, it, it was not really for verse 45. Because verse 45 is yet in the future. But my focus is on verse 43. Why? Because verse 43 is the event just before verse 45. Are you with me? Because if we see that verse 43 is fulfilling, that means verse 45 is coming soon. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah? Okay, verse 43, Daniel chapter 11, verse 43, the Bible says this, but he shall have what? Power over the what? Treasures of what? Gold and of silver over all the precious things of Egypt. Stop right there. Forty-three says he's going to have a power. That is going to be the event that's going to take place before he shall plan the tabernacle of his powers. So when the Bible says he shall have power, what kind of power? Power or what? Treasures of what? Gold and silver. I mean, what is he, a pirate? What does it mean he's going to have power over gold and silver? What does that mean? What is gold and silver back in those days? More than, you know, putting on their faces. Money, currency, finance. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe verse 43 is expressing how papacy is going to gain power. What kind of power? Financial power. But the financial power of who? Egypt, king of the south. You know what that means? King of the south is an enemy of king of the north. Which means he is going to gain a power over, he is going to have financial power over countries that are opposing to him. So he's going to have a power and control over his enemies, financially. You know, two years ago, was it two years ago? No, three years ago now. Uh, time is flying by. Remember Michael Jackson? For you, his life. And back in those days, Michael Jackson was my dude. You know? <laughs> Anyhow, do um, you remember when he died and they had a funeral? They used the Staples Center nearby here. That happened on the month of July, I remember, on Tuesday. And you're like, wow, you really like Michael Jackson. <laughs> no, not like that. 
happened, I just, just, I just, you know, I was in the airport and everywhere on the news. Yeah. So, so everybody was, uh, you know, paying attention to Michael's funeral. But on the same day, another news came out. On the very same day, another news came out, and nobody paid attention to that one. Why? They all looking at Michael. <laughs> How thrilling that was. Anyhow. But that another news that came out that day, it was really more globally earth-shaking news than Michael's death. But nobody paid attention. And that news came out of Vatican. Pope himself. He said, in order to solve our global financial crisis, we have to establish global authority. But nobody heard. They were paying attention to Michael Jackson. Young people, you may miss out the final events because you're watching too much on American Idol. <laughs> and then three months ago, 2011, October, news came out again, even more with stronger language. In order to solve the global financial crisis, it says we have to have global financial leader. You know how Europe is going down, right? Even Italy is going down. Only one country is not going down. You know which one that is? It's Vatican. So, if you use a common sense, who is going to be the savior in this case? One that has a financial crisis? One that has no financial crisis? I don't know how you understand these verses in Daniel chapter 11, but I see those verses very significant. In fact, I know for sure in the last days, final events are closely tied, closely connected to finance. Even the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast is about you cannot Buy and sell. It's about finance. But look at this language. And when I read this again, it shocked me. Revelation chapter 13. Go there with me. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Are you there? And verse 16, the Bible says, And he caused all, meaning he is forcing everyone to receive something. Then it says, uh, He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So you can, so you can say, oh, uh, this Bible text is saying that uh, um, they're going to, force, to uh, force everyone to receive the mark of the beast. But listen, listen. Notice the way the Bible is describing all. It says, great and small, rich and poor, free and bond. The Bible could have expressed it this way. He will force all to receive this. All, meaning black and white, Asians and Hispanics. Are you with me? Or the Bible could have said, all, meaning all nations. All tribes, all people, yes? But no, the way the Bible describes all, small and great. When you read that, what do you imagine? Small and great. Great is what? The Caucasians and the small is the Asian people? <laughs> is the Bible? Like, What do you mean small and great? What are you, so, so we don't get it, we don't get it, we don't understand. Small and great, what's that talking about? But the next description, 
rich and poor. The Bible is describing everybody with financial language. It gives me the idea that in the last day, it's going to be my friend, it's about finance. You will be categorized based on your finance. Rich and poor. Instead of saying all tribes. And then it says, so small, poor, great, rich. Now we understand. Then it says, free and bond. It means free and slave. Free, rich. Slave, you're poor. And you're, you're looking at me like, what? Slavery will come back? Yeah, the Bible says. I don't know how, uh, what kind of slavery it's going to be, but many of us, we're already slaves. Yeah, you got this chain, invisible chain, connected to your credit cards. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin to get a credit card, okay? But the uh, American dream is to be a very fancy, happy slaves. <laughs> we call ourselves beautiful bird in a golden cage. <laughs> now things are getting pretty serious. Because this financial crisis that we're seeing, I am not saying the current financial crisis is the fulfillment of the Bible. I'm not saying that. But the current global financial crisis is so big enough that we better pay attention. It is a very good chance that the Bible is telling us we better wake up now. Because the American dream can be gone just like that. The freedom can be taken away just like that. I love this country for its religious freedom. But I just wonder how long this freedom is going to last. Verse 43, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and the precious, thing, precious things of Egypt. I think you better come back this afternoon. Because this afternoon I am going to talk about something that you don't want to miss. So I want to ask you, how many of you here today? You want to say to God, God, Help me not to be hypnotized by the things of the world so that I am alert, awakened, watching, and praying so that I know what time we're living in. Amen. If you do, stand. Just a good life. 
here in this world. You know why? You are not going to get it. If you stay faithful to Jesus. But you will get it. You will get it. When Michael, the Archangel, Jesus Christ, when he comes back. If you have good things now, thank God. Amen. But the good things of this world should not be your focus. Stay awake and understand. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so close. We're so right in the midst of the final events. Help us, oh God, that we may have that the most important experience in our life and that is to really, really meet you and have this incredible experience with God. So open our eyes, teach us to pray. Help us to watch. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.